The following exhortation is from Jonathan Edwards' Parable of the Ten Virgin Sermons. Let us rouse out of sleep. Let every one in which on examination he finds himself asleep, awake. Let natural men rouse themselves. Don't let us listen to carnal reasoning, which are but the dreams of those that slumber and sleep. Let us set about it in good earnest. Stir up yourselves and stir up one another. Let the first step of amendment be in our walk. Let us avoid those things that are carnal, and then let again the next step be in our talk. No people on earth have such great obligation and loud calls to be awake in religion, and not to be in such a frame of slumber and sleep. God has lately smitten us. Let it not be to be said of us as of those that are in a drunken sleep. Proverbs 23:35. They have stricken me, and so on. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. To those that are awake, take care. Don't fall asleep. Let those few that are awake again do their utmost, that others may be woken up that are sleeping around them. You, if awake, see that which they don't see. You can see the lamentable circumstances they are in. Use endeavors by your example and by prudent counsels and reproofs. Awake others by earnest prayers. Let wakeful Christians amongst us, those that arouse with united strength and grace, try if they can't call down the influences of the Spirit of God to awaken others, as well as more thoroughly to arouse themselves. There is great encouragement for your fervent prayers. If the prayers of the saints have in time past shut up an open heaven, to cause showers of rain to cease or be poured out, much more can they call down the influence of the Holy Spirit. James, chapters 5, 16 to 18. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it didn't rain on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. We are upon the parable of the ten virgins in the beginning of Matthew 25, especially 5 to 7. And speaking of those things in which true Christians and false may agree through the infirmities and failings of true Christians, there were six things observed from these three verses. Number one, abundance of corruption. Number two, their spiritual frames. Number three, their acts and ways. Number four, in a time of decay of religion. And number five, the one great reason of both true Christians and false slumbering and sleeping is that Christ tarried. When true Christians slumber and sleep, the midnight cry is like to be unexpected and surprising to them as well as to others. Having spoken to the first four of these, I come now to the fifth thing wherein true and false Christians may agree, namely, that one great reason of both wise and foolish virgins slumbering and sleeping as they do is the bridegroom's tarrying. The virgins, when they first set out, expected soon to meet the bridegroom. When the bridegroom tarried and they grew weary of waiting, and as it was late in the night, their natural inclination was to sleep. They began to doubt whether he would come. Here it must be remembered that by false Christians, as by the foolish virgins is meant, all that live under the light of the gospel and attend its ordinances, and pretend to be Christians or the followers of Christ, that are not sincere and real Christians, but are indeed natural men, so that all that belong to Christian assemblies are either true Christians or false. Those among us that are in a Christless, graceless condition are false Christians. They are some of the foolish virgins spoken of in this parable. They all hope to enter in with the bridegroom into the marriage. This tarrying of Christ is especially with respect to a twofold coming, number one. With respect to his coming into day of judgment, one great reason why the visible church of Christ does so slumber and sleep as it does is that it is so long before the great day comes. The doctrine of the day of judgment in which men are taught that Christ will come with glory, majesty, and mighty power on the clouds of heaven to judge the quick and the dead, and that all, both small and great, must stand before him to give an account, is a very awful and awakening doctrine, tending very much to rouse both saints and sinners, and excite to watchfulness and diligence that they may be ready for such a day. 
But this doctrine has been preached in the world now for many ages, but men see nothing of the accomplishment of it, and many that hear of it are the less moved by it, because they look upon it as at a great distance. They hear that there are many things yet to be accomplished in the world before the day of judgment, and they never expect to see it while they live, nor till a great while after they are dead. Hence the visible church of Christ in the world is in a more drowsy condition. It is not generally expected throughout the Christian world that Christ would quickly and suddenly appear. It is not likely that there would be that carelessness and deadness in religion that there now is. It would doubtless greatly change the face of things in the church of Christ. Men's minds would be otherwise engaged than they are now, and their practice would be far otherwise. And we are taught in the scripture that, near to the end of the world, it shall be an exceeding dead time as to religion, and a time in which wickedness shall dreadfully prevail, a time of the great prevailing of idolatry and a spirit of atheism, Luke 18, verse 8. When the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith on the earth? And the one great reason of it will be, Christ staying so long before he comes to judgment. Many shall make also of it as an argument that Christ is an impostor, and that there will never be any such thing as the day of judgment, and that there is no truth in religion, Second Peter 3, verses 3 and 4, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation and that it will then be a time of exceeding prevailing of a spirit of negligence and carelessness about the things of religion, and a time when men's hearts shall be wholly swallowed up in the cares and pleasures of the world, and given themselves up to all manner of licentiousness, Luke 17, verse 26, and so on. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man, they did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and a flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. And the scripture teaches us that then it shall be a time in which many professors of religion will apostatize and fall away. Christ is speaking of that time in Matthew 24, verse 12. Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. And we are also taught that then it shall be a time of great persecution in the church of God, in which Christ's nominal servants shall beat their fellow servants. And the reason given of this, and of their licentiousness and sensuality, is Christ's delay in his coming. Matthew 24, verses 48 and 49. And it is this time of great degeneracy that shall be a little before Christ come into judgment that he has a more special respect to in this parable when he says, While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept, intimating that that time will be a time of general drowsiness amongst all sorts, good and bad, so that when Christ has really come to judgment, he shall, as it were, find the whole world in a midnight sleep, not expecting his coming and neither good nor bad, and an actual preparedness for it. His tarrying with respect to this coming of his is one great reason why both true Christians and false slumber and sleep as they do. Death is awful in itself, as a dissolution of the human frame, and a final leaving this world, and a separation of soul and body. But it is a much greater thing, considered with respect to the change it makes in the circumstances of the soul, and as an inlet into eternity, and a summons before God's awful judgment seat. And the consideration of it, and true sense of it, would tend greatly to awaken and quicken both true Christians and false. But one great reason why it is none of this effect is because it tarries, and doesn't yet come, and so is beheld and looked on as at a distance. Christ's tarrying with respect to his coming in these respects has influence on both good and bad to be an occasion of their slumbering and sleeping in the following ways first. It seems the less real that Christ will come. Things that are at a distance and not yet seen are ready to appear to us as if they were not real things, but to look like dreams or fables. 
The day of judgment is the less realized amongst men, because it is that which we have heard of from our infancy and never have yet seen. And it is that which has been preached to the world age after age, but never has yet been accomplished. So it is a difficult thing to realize that we're going to die. For though we all rationally know that we must die, not only the word of God, but universal experience teaches it, yet death, being that which we have often heard of, and never yet have been the subjects of, or known anything about by experience, and looking on it as nothing very near, it is hard to have a realizing view and sense of our own mortality, and to have imposed upon us as a thing in which that we must die. Death and the grave, and especially the eternal judgment that follows death, when we think of it with application to ourselves, is ready to be covered with a kind of mist, so that they look at things as very distant and scarcely appear as things real. Ungodly men, because they haven't been yet called to an account by the judge, and that eternal punishment they have heard so often of has not already come upon them, are ready to think it will never come. They have often heard the threatenings of God's awful displeasure against such as they and have been told how angry God is with them, but they don't see any tokens of God's anger. They don't feel anything of it. Things go on smooth and well with them year after year. God keeps silence. All things are still and quiet. So they don't realize it that God is so angry with them as they have heard. They have heard often of the dreadful misery of hell, and how that they that were in such a condition as they were every day in danger of it. But yet, it doesn't seem so. They don't find that they are disturbed or molested in their ways, but let alone. So they are led to call it in question whether there be any such thing as hell. Psalm 10, verse 6. He has said in his heart, I shall not be moved, for I shall never be in adversity. Psalm 50, verse 21. These things hast thou done, and I kept silence. You thought that I was altogether such an one as yourself, but I will reprove you, and set them in order before your eyes. And a godly, as they have remains of a spirit of unbelief, the spirit in them nourishes itself from the delay of Christ's coming. Spiritual and eternal things sometimes appear as real and certain to them, and they have a lively sense of their reality, and when they have, they are not asleep. But when they slumber and sleep, unbelief prevails. At such times they don't realize, as they should do, how that they must stand before the judgment seat of God. If they did, it would have a great tendency to rouse them out of their slumber, to make them more watchful and put them upon diligence to prepare to give an account of themselves to God. The reward that Christ has promised his disciples for their diligence in his service appears less real to them in their sleepy frames for it's being looked on as at a distance. Things at a distance are less affecting than things that are looked upon as very nigh, and that, though they are judged to be as certain, the carnal, unbelieving hearts of natural men and the carnal part in the hearts of the godly are ready to put Christ coming at a great distance because he has not come yet. We are all exceeding prone to that, to look on death and judgment as remote things, it looks remote to persons when they are young, i.e. remote from themselves, though it doesn't seem to them to be remote from others. When young persons look on those that are old, death looks very nigh to them, but yet when they come to be old, still death doesn't look nigh. Still there is the old disposition, works, namely, to keep death at a distance. And things that are looked upon as distant don't affect and move persons as things that are beheld nigh and at hand though they are not indeed of the less importance. Much of things that we view at a great distance in the air look little in comparison of what they do when they are near. The further they are removed, the less and less they look, till at last they vanish out of sight, though our reason tells us that they are as big as when we are near them. And thus by putting judgment and punishment at a distance, wicked men encourage and embolden themselves in sin. Ecclesiastes 8.11 because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily. Therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Amos 6, verses 3 to 6. You that put far away the evil day, and cause the seed of violence to come near, that lie upon beds of ivory, and stretch yourselves upon their couches, and eat the lambs out of the flock, and the calves out of the midst of the stall, that chant to the sound of the vial, and invent to themselves instruments of music, 
like David that drink wine in bowls and anoint themselves with the chief ointments, but they are not grieved for the affliction of Joseph. And so the godly themselves, through their infirmities and carnality and in their slumbering frames, are not so much moved by the promises of future rewards for their looking on them as at a distance, and so are not so engaged in pressing towards them. Through their infirmity they are in this, like children, who will be much more moved by the promise of an immediate reward than one to be bestowed many days from now. If Christ's coming was apprehended to be very nigh, either by death or the last judgment, men would not think it worth their while to be much concerned about these things, being that they must so soon have forever done with them. But Christ's deferring is coming, they are ready to treat these things as if they were everlasting things, and setting their hearts much on them, they very much engross the affections and concerns of the mind, and have stupefying influence on the soul to make it dead to the things of religion, and involve it in a great deal of sin. For the apostle has taught us that the love of the things of this world is the root of all evil, First Timothy 6.10. Men, by this means, being inordinately engaged after the pursuits and honors of the world, become covetous and proud and contentious and envious, and pursuing after pleasures, they become licentious and very sensual. This exceedingly stupefies the heart. The godly, when they are in their slumbering frames, they look on their future inheritances at a distance, and so don't think so much of that. But their present possessions they are ready to think of long continuance, and so are ready to have their hearts taken up with them, which involves them in many snares. And lastly, this is a temptation to them to delay and put off a preparation for Christ's coming till hereafter. They have lived hitherto, and Christ has not come yet, and they are ready to hope for time enough hereafter. Thus natural men delay and put off getting an interest in Christ, and the godly are ready to delay to stir up themselves to get into an actual preparedness. Hope to be in better frames before they die, would not have death come and find them in such frames as they are now in. We may suppose that both the wise virgins and foolish, when they began to give way to a sleepy disposition, hoped that they should wake up again time enough before the bridegroom should come. They had waited so long, and he had not come, that they began to think it would be a long time before he came, and thought they might have a convenient time to sleep, and yet be ready when he actually came. Thus foolish virgins put off buying oil for their lamps, like natural men seeking grace, who delay and put off seeking. Hypocrites, and those that have false hopes of their state, delay that thorough examination of their state, even as the foolish virgins delay trimming their lamps before the coming of the bridegroom. If those that have false hopes expected soon to appear before him, whose eyes are as a flame of fire, they would not rest in those things that they do now. They cannot be quiet and easy in such sorts of signs and evidence as they are now in. They would not think themselves so safe as to dare to go to sleep. The godly would not so neglect themselves. They would be more thorough to obtain sensible and clear experiences and lively evidences of their good estate, and seek assurance they would not put off trimming their lamps till hereafter, but would do it daily as continually expecting the bridegroom. Application The use that I would make of what has been said under this head is to warn both godly and ungodly against so ill an improvement of the bridegroom's tarrying, and to enforce this warning I would offer some things to your consideration first. Consider that you will at last see that this is a foolish improvement of Christ's tarrying. There is nothing got by giving way to the inclination of the flesh, to slumber and sleep while the bridegroom tarries. Many thousands and millions have lost their souls by it. The foolish virgins, if they had not spent the time in sleep, but on the contrary, had been watchful and had gone in season to buy oil, and had kept awake to keep their lamps burning, might have been ready might have escaped that misery, and might have had the same privilege with the rest of the virgins. And what losers the godly will be by it will be seen more fully under the next head of discourse. By the slumbering and sleeping while the bridegroom tarries, he will but make a work of repentance. Second, 
Consider that now Christ's coming may seem distant to you, yet when the time comes and you look back, it won't seem distant from the present time. The time of Christ's coming often seems very distant when persons look forward before it has come, but never when it looks back after it has come. Then the time it will appear as it is, but a very short time. Then you will see the truth of what Christ has said concerning his own coming in Revelation 22, verse 20. He that testifies these things says, Surely I come quickly. And also of what the apostles have said in Philippians 3, verse 5, The Lord is at hand. James 5, 9, The judge stands before the door. Then when you come to look back on the time past, between that and the present, how short will it appear, even as it were a moment, a dream, a tale that is told, a mere nothing, a spate that has slipped away before you were aware. Then you will see that time to be so short that you will be convinced that you had no time to sleep in it. Then will you see what need there was that all of it should have been spent in the most watchful diligence. Then you will be, as it were, between time and eternity. And then the whole of time that is passed with you before Christ's coming will appear as nothing. Consider that you don't know how soon the bridegroom will come. Tis an unreasonable way of arguing that the corrupt carnal hearts of men fall into that because they have often heard of Christ's coming, and have been warned to be prepared for it, and that notwithstanding he has not yet come, and that therefore his coming is at a distance, it in no wise follows. It is an inference that corruption and not reason draws from such premises. You know not but that the bridegroom is now just at the door, while you are slumbering, and many of you without a drop of oil in your vessels and your lamps totally gone out. Many have argued, as you now do, that because a bridegroom is tarried before, that therefore he will tarry yet a great deal longer, and so have given themselves time to go to sleep, and contrary to their expectation, the midnight cry has been presently heard. Before they have slept any long time, they have been awaked up again with that solemn cry, and see that it was so indeed. Surely the proper and most rational improvement that you can make of this uncertainty of the time of Christ's coming is to be found always waking and always ready. This is the improvement Christ makes of it in the conclusion of this parable in Matthew 25, verse 13. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man comes. And the same he often makes of it elsewhere is the 42nd verse of the preceding chapter. Watch, therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord does come forth. This improvement of the bridegroom's tarrying is the most ungrateful improvement, and that Christ hitherto has tarried to give us opportunity to be the better prepared for his coming. It is an instance of his great mercy and long suffering to sinners that he hasn't yet come to judge them, but has been waiting to be gracious, giving them a space to repent in, giving them opportunity to go and buy oil that so when he comes they may enter in with him into the wedding feast, Second Peter 3, verses 9 and 10. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us were, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heaven shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Sinners, therefore, in making such an improvement of Christ tarrying hitherto, are very ungrateful, as well as very foolish, when Christ stays to give them opportunity to prepare, and they, instead of that, improve it to be more and more unprepared. And so when the godly make this improvement of the bridegroom's tarrying, they are guilty of great ingratitude to Christ, for by this he gives them opportunity to be better prepared. Though they have some preparedness for his coming, yet by his tarrying they have opportunity to get in much better preparation for it, to get more grace, more oil, and to meet the bridegroom with a brighter lamp, and so to have more abundant entrance administered to them with a bridegroom into the marriage. Let both sinners and saints amongst us be both warned from these things to rouse out of their slumber. There are many of you that are here present of both sorts that are now asleep. All that you have heard hitherto from the subject has not awoken you, but you still go on slumbering. If you knew that the bridegroom was to come tomorrow, would it not rouse you? Would you not in many respects carry yourself very differently from what you now do? Then consider that you know not but that it will be on the morrow, yea, in this very night, 
you that are Christless souls and unawakened and sleeping on the brink of hell, going on in the ways of sin, consider that you know not but that this night your soul shall be required of you. Christ may come by an apoplexy or some such disease, and you may suddenly drop down dead, as many others have done, or you may die in your beds and your sleep, that you sleep this night, may be your last sleep out of which you shall never wake but in hell. Yea, I would put it to you further, whether if you knew that Christ would come to call you to his judgment seat this year, you would live as you do now. Would you live so careless? Would you live so negligent and slothful, so worldly and carnal if you knew? Why then consider how likely it is that there are some of you with whom it will be thus. There are people here somewhere amongst us. We know not where to look for him. We know not in what seat or pew, but God knows him by name. He sees the spot where he or she sits. He knows how it is with him, whether he is a true Christian or a false one. He sees whether he is awake or asleep. He knows the frame of his mind that he is now at this present time, and what he thinks while he is hearing this discourse. It may be he is one of those that is in a careless, slothful way, neglecting a soul. It may be he is one that has of late lived in some evil way. It may be he is one that has lived in some secret sin, filthy, forbidden pleasures, and gratifying some lust time after time in the dark, or very lately has so done, and it may be notwithstanding a special profession of religion. Very probably, if that person knew how soon Christ would come and call him to an account, he would be far from living as he now does. Matthew 24, verse 43. Know this, that if the good men of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have allowed his house to be broken up. Let us every one seriously consider these things, and that the Lord would give all wisdom to make a good improvement of them. Applications to those that are asleep in their sins to awaken them. Consider how dreadful that amazement will be first. How many things there will be to contribute to it. The greatness of that which decry declares, the greatness of its importance to you is of immediate concern. It respects your whole interest, the welfare of body and soul to eternity. When you go to meet a great judge, you will be immediately before a being of infinite majesty, holy and justice. Consider your exceeding unpreparedness for eternity, whether your nature is not unchanged, the dreadful reigning corruption in your heart, the sins you have committed, the calls slighted and opportunities lost, mercies alienated, your sins all unpardoned and with no savior. Second, your terror and surprise will be without remedy. There will be no avoiding the judgment, no hindering it, though you cry to the mountains. The things that now quiet you will be no remedy then. There will be no worldly enjoyments. You will have only false hopes, no friends, and no time given you. Time and opportunity will be at an end. Your amazement that you will have then will be but the beginning of your amazement. Often wicked persons are in great amazement on their deathbeds, but this is but a beginning, and light in comparison. Sometimes they have such fear on a deathbed as makes them tremble and groan and cry out. They go from this world groaning and crying to God for mercy. But this is but a light thing in comparison of what it will be at the day of judgment. That tear and amazement that is then begun will last to all eternity, but only in an immensely great degree. Let those that are asleep awake. Let others that are now awake remain awake. You have heard what you will be exposed to by it. There will be no security from it if you give way to a slumbering spirit. If you are slothful or worldly or unwatchful, you will only be saved as by fire, as when a man is waked at midnight when his house is on fire and he is scarcely saved. Don't think there is no danger of this because you are converted. Here consider three things first. What pity it is that such persons as you hope you are should needlessly expose themselves to a surprise as this, those that are in such a blessed condition that God has done so much for, and that have such a foundation laid for their comfort and rejoicing at such great expense, and by such a wonderful work of God as he has wrought in their redemption. What a pity it is that such persons as souls for whom comfort has been purchased at such a price should deprive themselves of comfort, and hide the foundation of their joy from themselves, and so expose themselves to fears and terrors. 
Second, how especially undesirable is fear and surprise at such a time as when that cry is heard, Behold, the bridegroom comes, or when they come to be in a deathbed and seem to be leaving the world to go into eternity. Doubts and fears are undesirable at any time, but especially at such a time. For then above all times in the world will the saints need to have clear evidences of their preparedness and of the light of God's countenance. Doubting and fearing on a deathbed will be more terrible at such a time than any other. Then will be a most important season, a season in which great work is to be done. Tis a great thing to die, for then it will be a juncture in which all things with respect to the eternal state immediately will be determined. Then will be a most important change. When the saints come to die, they will especially need clear evidences of preparedness. Tis probably enough to do to grapple with the distemper on a deathbed. Death is terrible to nature, destroying the frame of the body before leaving all the world because surprise will be very unsuitable and improper for saints on such an occasion. Tis a proper occasion of rejoicing to be saints, waiting to hear the midnight cry, then called to meet the bridegroom. Let these things be effectual with you, to move all that have this hope in them, to stir up themselves and to take heed that. Let Christ come when he will, he may not find him slumbering, but watching with their garments on with their loins girt about with truth, being diligent and laboring in all their duty, watching and fighting against all sin and fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Jonathan Edwards, While the Bridegroom Tarried, from the Parable of the Ten Virgins.